Okay, so hello class. This is my attempt to keep you caught up even though I have to be on campus and not feeling well. So last time we talked a lot about the electric dipole. We're going to do just a little bit more about that in this lecture and then get into electric fields of continuous charge distributions. So we said our electric dipole had two charges, plus and minus q, separated by a small distance d. Let's ask what happens if we place the electric dipole in an external electric field E. So here's our external electric field. What happens to our electric dipole? So let's start to think about the forces that act on the dipole. This is a positive charge in an electric field, it's going to feel an electric force. And that electric force F is equal to charge times the electric field. Our charge is positive, so the force and the field are going to be in the same direction. Um, what about the force on the negative charge? Well, it's a negative, so our force is going to be opposite the direction of the electric field. F equals minus Q times E. So now there's our force analysis. Let's find what the sum of those forces are going to be. So the sum of the forces is going to be the force on the positive charge plus the force on the negative charge. I'm so sorry, the dog wants out. Just give me a sec. Okay, sorry about that pause. So if we want to think about the resulting motion and if we're going to do a force analysis, let's find the net force. So the force on the positive plus the force on the negative. Well, those two are equal and opposite. It just equals zero. So what does it mean that the net force is zero? Well, it means overall that our dipole is not going to move left or right. It's not going to translate. Is that the full description though? So let's think about our dipole. The force on the top points right, the force on the bottom points left. This thing is actually going to rotate. Um, why does it rotate? Well, it's going to rotate because the torque is not zero. And this might remind you of the motor lab you did in physics 1051. So let's think about what is the net torque on our dipole. The net torque, and torque is certainly a vector, is the torque on the positive charge plus the torque on the negative charge. Here we may remember from physics 1050 that torque is equal to R cross F, where R is our lever arm from the pivot to the charge, and the magnitude of torque is R times F times sine phi. Phi is the angle between the vectors R and F when those two are drawn tail to tail. So we'll pick a center of rotation. That'll be the center of the dipole. From here to here is distance D. So from here to here is D over 2. Here to here is D over 2. So my torque on my upper charge, my positive charge, is going to be the distance, d over 2, between my pivot and my charge, times my force, that's q times e, times the sine of the angle between the moment arm and the force. So if we draw a line that extends this way, there's our angle phi. Um, this will tend to rotate clockwise. So there's the torque on the positive. I'm going to add the torque on the negative, so the distance is d over 2 again, times the magnitude of the force, q times e, times sine of phi, so if we draw a straight line here, this is our angle phi, or if we extend down here, that's our angle phi. And the rotation direction, again, will be clockwise. So then our net torque, so we've got d over 2 qe sine phi plus d over 2 qe sine phi. Our net torque is going to be d times q times e times sine phi. dq, you might recognize that as the dipole moment that we defined last time. 
And dipole moment, of course, is a vector. So then our torque on our dipole, our net torque on our dipole, can be given as a vector equation. So this is P times E times sine phi. Recognize that looks like the magnitude of a cross product. Our net torque is P dipole moment crossed with the electric field. So one thing that this is telling us is that if our dipole is upright in the field, we'll get the maximum torque and it will twist it this way. If our dipole is horizontal in the field, it won't experience any torque at all. So the torque is going to tend to make the dipole line up with the external field. If we wanted, we could also do an energy analysis here and relate the energy to the dipole moment. Okay, next in the slide is some homework examples. I'm not going to work through those in a video, but I will post the answers for you to see if you want to compare. And then we're going to get right onto our continuous charge distributions. So in physics 1051, we did a lot of electric fields around point charges and groups of point charges, but of course not everything is a point charge. The image that I've got here, this is an electric field lines around an electric eel. Um, eels, they use this electric field to know where they are and how to communicate, so that's really kind of interesting. We're going to get started on finding the electric fields of continuous charge distributions around charged objects with different shapes and geometries. So that's where we're going with this. Okay, I'm just trying to get all my notes here together. I'm in a little bit of a brain fog, um, so please bear with me. I might just be a little bit slow here, but I am doing my very best. Okay, so let's just go back to the standard physics 1051 approach. If we had had, say, seven discrete charges, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, if we wanted to find the electric field at point P, we would find the electric field due to charge one and the electric field due to charge seven. So there is E7. There is E1. Um, you might notice here that they both point right, seven points up and one points down. Those Y components would cancel. And then we would do the electric field from charge two, E2, and our electric field from charge six. We would notice that our two and six Y components cancel, but the X components point right. Then we would do five and three pointing away from those positive charges. We'll see that those y's cancel and the x's add up. And then due to 4, that's only horizontal, E4. So if this were physics 1051, we would find each of those electric fields. We would either calculate them or we would just say that the y component summed to 0 due to symmetry. We would find that our net electric field pointed to the right. So the y components cancel. and our net field is the sum of all the x components in the x direction. If you wish, you can pop open a FET simulation, PHET, um, electric fields. You can put in your seven charges and you can look at what the field looks like right there. So our net electric field is the sum of each individual electric field. We're trying to approach continuous charge distributions. So let's start to ask, how do we get a continuous charge distribution? So the first thing we're going to do is let's take all of our seven charges and let's just push them together, squeeze charges together. We can still see that they're discrete charges. They're just tight together. So we could follow exactly our same approach and we would find the same result. We would find that our net electric field would point completely to the right. The Y components would cancel and the X components are the ones we would add up. So our net elect, so our total electric field vector would be the sum of each individual electric field. We would know that we would only have to add up the x's because the y's would cancel it. 
So in this we have individual charges. Here we're going to say we have little individual charges. We'll call those little charges QI. Okay, so we're getting closer. This looks more like a line of charge than this does. How do we make it a perfect line of charge? Well, we've got to squeeze them closer together still. Got to make them smaller and we have to squeeze them really close together. So to get a true continuous charge distribution, we mean something like a line of charge. Let's think about a piece of copper wire, for example. And what we do is instead of seven smallish charges, we take many, many, many very small charges and we push them really close together. So here we have individual charges, QI. In this line, we're going to have a whole bunch of little teeny tiny charges. Right? Way too many for me to draw. And each of those little teeny tiny charges, rather than call QI, we're going to call those DQ. So QI goes to DQ. Now, just like every one of these charges made an electric field here at point P, and the Y components canceled, and we were left with the X components to get a net field that point to the right, same thing happens here. Each of these little teeny tiny charges will make a small electric field right here. We'll add them all up. We'll see that all the Ys cancel, and we'll be left with a total electric field that points to the right. So same behavior. We're just getting a better description. In this one, we did a discrete calculation of seven point charges, and we did the sum of each individual charge, the x component, and the answer was in the x direction. When we have so many char small charges here, our sum now becomes an integral. So each little charge makes a little electric field. To add up all those little electric fields, we say we take an integral. So an integral is our sum of many small pieces. Okay, so that's the idea. That's what we're going to do. Um, you can do this on a FET simulation as well if you wanted to see what that looked like a little more closely. So here's our seven discrete charges. Here's where I tried to get closer to a line of charge. You see it still does point to the right. The field's getting bigger here because we've got more charges added. So let's start to go through the process. I tried to type out a bunch of these notes here so you wouldn't have to um, write so many down yourself. If you prefer to write them all out on your own, of course, feel free if that helps you um, assimilate. So we're going to go through the process. I'm going to approach it very methodically so you can follow this approach for any charge distribution in any geometry and the strategy will work for you. So the very first thing we do is we look at our charge distribution and we're going to divide our rod into many small elements of charge. So we're breaking them down into all those little teeny tiny bits of charge all the way along the rod. Remember, these are really tiny. They're even too small for us to draw. My little circles here are just illustrative. And then what we do is we show one element of this charge DQ. We don't draw it at the end and we don't draw it in the middle. Okay, so not at the end and not at the middle. So I'm going to pick one DQ right here. I'm going to color it in. So that's my little element of charge DQ. In math terms, when you have a small piece of something, that's called an element. So a small piece is an element. So that's our first bit, is we identify a small piece of the charge. Um, next, we know that every charge Q makes an electric field, KQ over R squared. So every small bit of charge DQ makes a small bit of electric field, K times DQ over R squared. So I'm going to draw the electric field made by this bit of charge at our point P here. It's a positive rod, so my electric field is going to point away. So there's my DE. It is a vector. Can't forget that part. Okay, so because it's a vector, we know that it has components. So that bit's done, that bit's done, this bit is done. Now we have to draw the components. My X is horizontal, so my X component is going to be to the right. There's my DEX. And my Y component is going to be down. DEY. Remember, this is the little electric field made by this little tiny bit of charge. Our goal is to add up every little bit of electric field made by every little bit of charge. That's where we're going with this. Okay, that bit's done. Write an expression for DE 
dex and dey. So we know that E is equal to K times Q over R squared for a point charge. So if we have a little tiny bit of charge, it makes a little tiny bit of field, DE, and that's K times a little tiny bit of charge divided by R squared. I've written R here, I should put R in my picture. R is from my charge to my point. Okay, there's R. Um, what? Next, we also want DEX and DEY, so that's going to be our regular trigonometry. DEX, let's label an angle theta. I'll call this one theta, which makes this one theta. DEX is adjacent to my angle, so it's going to be DE times cosine theta. And DEY is opposite my angle, so it's going to be DE times sine theta. Okay, hopefully everybody is still with me. So there's steps 1, 2, and 3 done. And remember, these steps are going to work no matter what the geometry or the object is. You just have to apply them to what you have. To get to step four, I say identify the parameters. So let's make sure we know what we're talking about in this problem. What are the variables? What are the constants? Because ultimately, we want to be able to do an integral. So our x-axis is horizontal. That means our distance x is from our rod to our point. So this is x. So I'm going to say that x is my horizontal distance. Now, no matter which location of dq I'm at, so no matter where I pick my dq, this value of x is the same because it's the horizontal distance between the rod and the point. If my dq is here, my horizontal distance is still here, 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 and here. That x doesn't change, so that one's a constant. Because we're going to be doing integrals, it's a good idea to keep in mind what's constant and what's variable. My y is from my origin to my dq. So there is my y. Remember, my dqs are little bits of charge all along the rod. So y, my vertical distance between the center where my p is and my dq, that one's variable because every little dq will have a different value of y. Okay, that's x and y done. Now let's start to look at the geometry. I see that r is the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle, so r squared is x squared plus y squared, or r is equal to x squared plus y squared to the 1 half. Cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent is x, hypotenuse is r. Sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse y over r. Okay, so there's our parameters and our geometry. Let's move on to the next step. And our next step is going to be to write dq in terms of the parameters. So we want to relate dq to x or y or r or theta. So we want to get a relationship in there because ultimately we want to be able to do an integral. So let's think about how we're going to do that. Okay, so what we have here is a summary of everything we've written down so far. That's DE, DEX, and DEY. There's our parameters. That's our distance r right here. Here's our cos theta and our sine theta. Now for our dq. So we're wanting to relate dq to the geometry in order that we can do an integral. In general, we're either going to have a one-dimensional object, that's going to be a line of charge, or we're going to have a two-dimensional object, that might be a plane of charge or a disk, or a three-dimensional object, that might like be a sphere or a cube or a box. Our method that we're following applies to all of these. Um, so if we want to relate our charge to the size of the object, we're going to start thinking about charge density. So charge density for a linear object will be a linear charge density, and it's the total charge divided by the total length. Our linear charge density is lambda. That's going to be Q divided by L. If we have a plane of charge, we talk about surface area charge density. That's sigma, and that's charge divided by area. If we have a sphere or a cube, three-dimensional, we're talking about a volume charge density. That's given by rho, which is charge over volume.
Right now the problem we're focusing on is one dimensional, so here's where we're going to need to sit. We're going to talk about linear charge density, which is total charge on the rod divided by the total length of the rod, and that's called lambda. Okay, charge density is charge divided by length. That means then that charge, amount of charge on any piece of that rod will be the density times the length. Okay, hopefully that idea is okay to understand. If we had half the rod, it would be the density times half the length, and that would give us the charge on half the rod, for example. We want to find the amount of charge on our little bit of charge dq. Well, our amount of charge dq is going to be the charge density lambda times the length. Well, what is the length of this little bit of dq? Now this step is really important. We have to identify what the length is. So the length is a little bit in the y direction. If it's a little bit in the y direction, that has a length that we call dy. So my dq is the lambda times the length, or lambda times dy. Okay, I hope that's easy to understand. And remind you here that lambda is the charge density, it's a total charge divided by the total length. We've picked dy because this is a vertical rod. Um, so the length of the rod is all in the y direction, so a little bit of an element will be a little bit in the y direction. If you were asking what I could do if it was a horizontal rod, that would be a great question. And I've got that filled in on the next slide, just so that you have your complete set of notes if you want to apply it to a different geometry. If we had a horizontal rod instead, if it pointed this way, then our little bit of dq would be a little bit in the horizontal direction, dx. Um, if we had a circular rod, so a little bit of a circle, our length would be a little bit of the circle, ds, and arc length. Okay, so that's how you would apply it if you had a horizontal rod or a circular rod. Our next step now is to write expressions for dex and dey. We're going to put all these things together. So dex is going to be de, kdq over r squared times cos theta. For dq, we're going to put in lambda times d, dy. For r, we're going to put in x squared plus y squared, take the square root. For cosine theta, we're going to put in x over r. So we're going to do that all together to get our dex, and we're going to do likewise with our dey. Okay, so let's get started on that process. So now we want to do dex by substituting in everything we know here for these expressions. So dex equals de times cosine theta, so that's our dex. de was k times dq over r squared. Cosine theta is x over r. dq is lambda times dy times x. r squared times r is r cubed k times lambda, normally we put the dy at the end, so I'm just going to swap x and dy. Our r has to be cubed, and remember r is x squared plus y squared to the 1 half. Okay, one last simplification step. k times lambda times x times dy over x squared plus y squared. When I've got an exponent to an exponent, you multiply the exponents, that's to the 3 over 2. Okay, before we move on and do the dey, I would just like to point out that this is our x component and I have a dy in it. This is correct. This dy, this comes from the length of our rod being a little bit in the y direction. Lots of times students don't like an x component going with dy, but it is absolutely correct. This is an artifact of the geometry. Okay. So now that we've got our dx done, let's also do our dy. We're going to do that one pretty similarly. Dey is de times sine theta equals k times dq over r squared. Sine theta is y over r. So I've got k, dq is lambda times dy times y over r cubed. k times lambda, I'll swap my y and dy. 
are x squared plus y squared to the 1 half. That all has to be cubed. k lambda y dy over x squared plus y squared to the 3 over 2. Okay, there are my x and y components of the little bit of electric field made by this little bit of charge. Remember, to get the total electric field, I have to add up all of the x bits to get my x component, and I have to add up all of my y bits to get my y component. Okay, just like you have to do with discrete charges, you have to do that here as well. So let's move on to step six. Okay, step six. Find the net electric field by integrating over the appropriate limits. Use symmetry if, if applicable. I'm sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat, so I've just got to put the uh, mic down and take a drink. <laughs> okay, so what this means is that my total x component of electric field is going to be the sum of all those individual x components, or the integral of dex, and my net y component, ey, is going to be the sum of all my y components. Um, use symmetry if applicable. So now what this means is let's look at our two components and ask will any of the sums turn out to be zero? So if I look at my rod, no matter where my dq is, if it's up here, my dx points right. If it's here, my dex points right. If it's here, my dex points right. If it's here, my dex points right. So no matter where I am, my e dexs point to the right. So overall, my ex is going to point right. What about my eys? If I'm on the top half of the rod, all of my deys point down. But if I'm on the bottom part of my rod, all of my DEYs would point up. That tells me that my total electric field in the Y direction is going to be zero. So every little bit of electric field due to a piece at the top, the Y component will cancel with a little bit of electric field from the bottom. If you don't catch that symmetry, it's no problem. It'll all shake out in the wash when you do the, uh, when you do the integral. Uh, last thing I will point out that EY, this part equals zero, DEY is not equal to zero. So this DEY is the Y component of this bit. Clearly that's not zero. We see it in the picture and we see it here. But a lot of times people say that the DEY, the element, is not zero. It only goes to zero when you take the sum. Okay, let's get started on the EX. I think I'll just grab a fresh sheet of paper. So my EX, maybe I'll turn sideways so it'll post easier. EX is the integral of DEX. Let's fill in what we had for our DEX. That was K times lambda times X times DY. And remember, we're okay with DY. That's because the rod is vertical. Over X squared plus Y squared to the 3 over 2. First thing we can do with integrals is take our constants out front. K lambda X. Remember, we said X was constant no matter where the DQ was. Okay, now that we're here, we know that we have to do the limits of the integral from some initial value of y to some final value of y. If we ask what the limits of the integration will be, they're going to be from one end of the rod to the other. So we want to add up due to each little bit of charge. The charge is spread over the entire rod. So one part of the rod is down here. The final part of the rod is up here. So let's say it starts here and it stops here. What does that mean that we put in for our y? Well, our origin is at the middle of the rod. The rod has a length of L. So the top half will go from 0 to plus L over 2. And the bottom will go from 0 to minus L over 2. 
Really important here, you can't say it goes from 0 to L because that doesn't match your coordinate system. Your coordinate system has the 0, has the origin at the center, so this is not 0, it's minus L over 2, and you don't get the same answer if you don't put in the correct limits. So in this geometry, it goes from the negative coordinate to the positive, minus L over 2 to plus L over 2. Okay, so let's put this in. So now our x component is k times lambda times x, the integral from minus l over 2 to plus l over 2 dy x squared plus y squared 3 over 2. This integral, you've got two choices. If you love to integrate, you can do this yourself. If you don't love to integrate, you can look this up. On a test, I will always give you a table of integrals with the appropriate integrals in there, so I will not ask you to integrate on a test k times lambda times x. This integral, when you look it up in the back of your book, is 1 over x squared times y over x squared plus y squared. That's evaluated at plus l over 2 and minus l over 2. So those are the values we're putting in for y. Mm, this x, one of these x's cancels with that x. So I've got k times lambda over x outside of l over 2 divided by x squared plus y squared, so l squared over 4, minus a minus l over 2, x squared plus, minus l over 2 squared is still going to be plus l squared over 4. And then for our final result, our x component, l over 2 minus minus l over 2 is going to give us plus l on the top here, k times lambda times l over x times square root of x squared plus l squared over 4. Okay, just a couple of things we could do here. If you wish, you could use the fact that lambda is q over l. So you could pop that in if you wanted q over l here. q over l times l would give you q here, no problem. We're also going to think about the sign. Which way does our x component point? Our x component points to the right. So this should be positive, and this is positive. If you flipped your limits of integration, if you went from plus L over 2 to minus L over 2, you'd get a negative here. Um, and then this step is where your common sense has to come into play. The x component points right, so whatever you get due to kind of how you do your limits here, you know that your answer needs to be positive in the end. Okay, so there's our x component. Let's also get our y component, even though we already think we know what that's going to be. So EY is the integral of DEY equals the integral of K lambda Y DY X squared plus Y squared to the 3 over 2. Very constants come out front. Y is a variable, so that's stuck inside. Same limits of integration from the bottom of the rod to the top. Okay, we'll look this one up in the book. Or you can do it yourself if you prefer. I'm not here to judge. Um, I'll look it up in the book for my result. And what I get is k times lambda over negative 1 divided by x squared plus y squared evaluated at l over 2 and negative l over 2. Put this in, I get k times lambda minus 1 over square root x squared plus l squared over 4 minus 1 over, oops, minus, minus 1, x squared plus l squared over 4. This gives us 0 just as we expected. So if you're not sure about the symmetry of your problems, don't worry about it. Go ahead and do the integral. You'll get the right answer. Okay, so then to finish, we always have to write our answer as a vector. So that's the x component next to the i hat with the y component next to the j hat. So our x component was k times lambda l over x times the square root of x squared plus l squared over 4. But the i hat there points to the right, so it has to be positive. Um... What else will I say? So the next slide is a homework slide, and we've got essentially the same problem, but I've just tilted it to be a horizontal rod. I'm going to go ahead and post the solutions, but you should make sure you can do this one on your own.